So we're moving away from machine learning inception towards uh, predicting credit fraud. Um, and uh, the team will take that away um, in a moment. Um, so another note I want to say, we'll have time to mingle at the end. I know we don't have too much time to ask all the questions we have. Um, but I implore you to get in touch with our students and ask them for the questions. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you, Janet. Uh, this team uh, scored number one on their category. Um, to the very top store, it is uh, sort of like the unicorn that you're searching for. Um, top 1%, number one, um, and uh, will take us away on their process on how they ensembled their way to the top. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Emma and Bruno. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, so my name is Emma. I just graduated from NYU, double majored in computer science and psychology with a minor in math. I took a few machine learning classes while at college, and I absolutely love them, so I am here. Hello, everyone. Um, very happy for you to all join us tonight. Um, I know you took time to kind of join us, so hopefully this information that we'll be sharing with you would be helpful. Uh, we do have the slides that are available for you, so anytime after the presentation, just reach out to me. Don't worry, we'll share all the deck with you guys. Uh, there's the, a lot of information we're going to be sharing. So in, within 10 minutes, hopefully we can share as much of that. You can take away something from this presentation and hopefully something that we could uh, maybe can continue to talk about after the presentation. So my name is Bernard Ong. Um, I work in mostly Fortune uh, 500 companies, Citibank for a couple of years, Citibank Tokyo and uh, New York. I also work for MetLife, the insurance business, for about five years. And then recently, I work for SMP Global Ratings for 10 years. So, you know, very involved in the ratings industry, finance, insurance. Uh, so a lot of the uh, processes that hopefully we can uh, share today would uh, go a long way in being able to help you out in terms of what you can bring back that you can use in the workplace, big corporations or startup. <coughs> Okay, so we chose a Kaggle kind of competition. It's a closed competition uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is we want to be able to, within the course of three months that we have learned all these models, everybody can learn the models, technicalities, the math, you know, how all the formats and algorithms are, but it's really a very different world out there when you try to actually implement it. Uh, most likely, when you encounter a lot of uh, people who know machine language, uh, machine learning, basically you, they know all the models. And the key is how do you actually use it produce literally results at the end of the day. So you have time constraints, constraints of resources, you gotta coordinate a team, what's the process, what does it take? Um, everybody might have already heard about agile process, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what that represents in the context of machine learning. Uh, it's a little bit different when you do, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, agile for traditional software development lifecycle and actually te technology delivery. For machine learning, we're going to share a little bit of this, what, what this represents. So we took a, a close challenge, which is basically predicting consumer debt default. Uh, this is what I call as the golden fleece of all bankers and uh, lenders. They want to be able to predict within two years, if you're going to cause a problem with us and not being able to pay off your loan, we want to know. It could be a service provider, it could be somebody selling a product, it could be literally a telephone company serving use services, we want to be able to tell within a few years, are you going to default on your loan? So this is the uh, data set that we have uh, from Kaggle, and it's about 10 features involved. Uh, I think these are all self-explanatory, like evolving utilization of secured lines, meaning how much uh, you owe over uh, the, the credit limits, your age is a factor, uh, how much or how many times you defaulted within the 30 to 60, 60 to 90, over 90. Uh, they even have the debt ratio, monthly income, number of open credit lines and loans. That's basically uh, how much you owe uh, you know, every month. And then the number of real estate loans and ultimately the number of dependents. Um, our goal for when we uh, took on this Kaggle competition is to literally try to hit the top 5%. One, the scores are already static, so we'll be able to see how we rank because something has to be constant, right, while you're developing the process. The, 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 the protocol to be able to use the combination of uh, models that you're going to be able to use. We want to be able to focus on optimizing and fine-tuning all these models. The data set we're dealing with is about 150,000 observations in the training set and about 100,000 for the test data set. This immediately, as if you're involved in machine learning, this gives you immediately a big problem. 
The problem comes in two flavors, two extremes. One is you have so much data that you need enough infrastructure and firepower to be able to process it. The other side of the equation or the extreme is you have so little data in the sense of your observations are so few, you cannot generalize the type of logic that you be able to model around. So this is one of the challenges we're facing is it's just that much more difficult because the number of features is not that huge, but also the observations are often not that big. We want to go into the project literally immediately within the two weeks time frame, be able to organize ourselves. So it's very important that we understand our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I uh, described a lot of what the threats are already, small data set, uh, top 5% goal, we put it out there as an arbitrary number, can we hit that or even get that better in terms of the ranking. Uh, extremely high tolerance of the AUC scores within the, uh, the, the leaderboard. So we notice as you climb the ranks, the tolerance for each point that you fight becomes tighter and tighter. We're literally in a Kaggle competition, if you've done one before, uh, when the tolerance are so few, you're fighting literally for the 10,000th or 100,000th of a point to climb the ranks. We experienced that firsthand. It was extremely excruciating. We're going to share a little bit of what that represents. In terms of opportunities, we want to be able to apply what we learned in terms of not just models, but being able to go beyond models, right? Uh, this was an offshoot from a previous project that we did on Higgs boson. We want to learn from that process be able to say what we're going to be able to optimize from taking it into the next level. We want to minimize manual model selection if we can. The parameters that we deal with, we do not want to manually be tweaking this because it could take forever for us to do. It's limitless of, uh, of combinations of hyperparameters that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, we want to also use a Bayesian optimizer to do a lot of the heavy lifting. We want to understand that technology. Is it mature enough to be able to use? Is it production ready? Is this something we can leverage to be able to help us climb the ranks? Uh, some of the weaknesses that we, we have to be careful about is the sense of um, learning extreme time constraints. We only have two weeks to prove this out. Uh, so we got to do a lot. The productivity has to be high. The process has to be right. The team has to be right. Um, in terms of our strengths, we have learned from previous projects what the models can do. We have some experiences on stacking. We want to take it to the next step understand how we can either apply and go beyond just stacking by using Bayesian optimizers or even voting classifiers. So, and then we want to inject the agile process in the whole thing. So what are the steps that got us to number one? Well, Bernard was talking about this agile process and this is what it looks like. Um, the components of this agile process are very similar to traditional machine learning processes. Um, where you start off with uh, data pre-processing and then some EDA looking at univariate distribution, variate distribution, and whatnot, and then some feature engineering, and then you start building models, and once you're happy with your score, create a submission file and then submit it to Kaggle. Um, the power of this agile process is that a lot of the steps are done in parallel. There are four different, uh, 14 members in our group. Unfortunately, two of them have uh, personal emergencies couldn't be here today. But there are four of us. And then we were uh, doing a lot of stuff in parallel. We were picking different algorithms, tuning hyperparameters, and building models all at the same time. Nobody's waiting around for anyone. And we were actually then doing missingness uh, imputation and feature engineering at the same time as well. Um, so that, that could speed up uh, things a lot. Um, so to give you guys an idea, we had two weeks to work on this project. By the middle of the first week, we were already able to rank in the top 100 um, on the leaderboard. And by the end of the first week, we were number two on the leaderboard, and we had a whole second week to get to number one. And now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the model execution strategy, because it's capital competition. The models are really the meat of this project. Um, there are uh, four different phases that we went through with model building. The first phase is single and ensemble models, where we played around with logistic regression and naive base. Uh, the reason we pick, pick those two is because it's a binary classification um, problem. We're predicting people, whether people are going to default or not. And then we also tried a few ensemble models, uh, mainly tree-based models, um, gradient boosting machine, actually boost. The, to get higher predictive accuracy, we've moved on to stacking models. Uh, the best performing model is this two-layer stacking model where we had one gradient boosting machine um, and then one actually boost as the base models and then a simple logistic regression as the meta model. 
and then we hit a plateau. So what we tried that worked was this voting classifier model. Uh, we also tried different different models, but the best is this 12 combination voting model with some gradient boosting machines, some naive base, some uh, random forest, and some ADA boost. And then our number one winning model is actually a voting and uh, stacking blended model, uh, where it, we use six model combination with some gradient boosting machine, random forest, ADA boost, and a restricted Boltzmann machine, which is actually a neural network model. And now, um, with this slide and the next two slides, I'm going to talk about uh, the, all the feature engineering that we tried. Um, so, as I was suggesting earlier, uh, we ha had some um, missingness in our data. We had two features out of uh, 10 features that had some missingness. Um, one of them actually had 20% missing, so we actually had to deal with it. Um, what we did that worked was replacing all the missing values with negative 99. Um, and then we're going to go into detail with that a bit later. And also we did a principal component analysis. We were wondering whether there is a small set of features that could explain the majority of the variances. And uh, as we expected, uh, it's not the case because the principal uh, component analysis suggested five principal components, which only explained about 66% of the variances, which is uh, pretty low, so we didn't move on with this analysis. And here, um, this all this two plots showed is that we actually have some outlier problem. You know, it's that you see that the uh, average range of the normal data uh, are uh, distributed right here, but you see some data points all the way here, which um, may cause us some problem. Uh, we, you know, did some uh, filtering methods, and then it seems that um, the outliers were causing a problem because if you look at um, this correlation plot, um, this is using the original data set um, with outliers. And you see that these three features are actually very highly correlated. So the dark blues meaning high correlation, and then white meaning zero correlation, and dark red meaning negative correlation. Um, but once we remove the outliers, um, you see that the, uh, the high correlation actually gone. They're um, minimized a lot. So a lot of the correlations uh, among those three features are actually due to the outliers, which is not the ideal case. Um, so the first thing we try with feature engineering is removing the outlier data. And we also tried uh, six other different feature engineering methods, but I'm not going to go into too much detail in this because we didn't end up using any of it. Um, and the reason is because that it turns out the uh, all feature engineering helped with naive based and logistic regression models. Um, they improved the EUC score from 0 0.7 to 0 0.85. However, with the tree based models, they didn't give us any improvement in the results. Okay, the next two slides um, basically describe a little bit more detail what the process is. Um, I could, this is the high level slide, and I have a next slide which is the detailed one. So I guess you guys want to move. I guess I, we could go into the detail, but I'll talk on a high level and we can discuss further if you have any more questions. So this is what it took basically our earlier slide that basically showed everything happening in parallel. This is the next level of detail. Actually, the next level of detail was the previous slide, but this one literally is the one that we had to follow uh, to literally arrive at the winning solution. So it looks complicated, but it's not. So let me explain quickly. If you're familiar with machine learning and the entire life cycle, if you just think about sequentially what you go through, you can literally look at all these boxes right here. So you basically deal with a lot of data, and the role in machine learning is find data. If you don't have enough data, get more data. If there's no more data, invent more data. If you can't, morph it into more. That's what we try along with everything else that's going on. But understand that just under, doing the feature engineering, which is really, you know, I, Emma just talked about the seven types of uh, feature engineer set that we did. Understand also we're dealing with missing data invitation, right? So we're trying all of that. This entire process, what we want to basically relay is that we're doing all of this in chunks. I think chunking is a key process here, right? Understanding that you have to chunk your work in pieces at the same time that you're doing everything in parallel. So as the imputation is being done, 
The results of those invitations are being passed through all the stages there while all of this is happening at the same time. The same thing when the feature engineering, we had you know, one of our folks, uh, Trinity, who is also doing a lot of feature engineering set, as new feature engineered data sets are coming through. We're also feeding that through all the type of models that's going through across. So we're dividing the entire work in chunks, going all in parallel, but having the top-down approach of feeding things. And as we find optimal points within all these tests, that's what we're kind of surfacing as the next step that feeds into the next process. So we went from doing the missing data invitation to feature engineering. I think we discussed a little bit about what that represents. Uh, it's always good to start with single model ensembles. Um, I always say that, you know, start with the basic. If you can optimize the basic, understand how missing data or featured engineer sets through act with your basic models, you get a health and heartbeat of the entire data. You want to understand how it behaves, how it reacts when you input a certain parameter or when you change it. How does the data behave? And the reason you can also do single model a little bit easier is because some of these actually computation efficiency is very high. You don't have the cost overhead of saying, you know, let me try this parameter, it's optimized, I think, and it's gonna run for the next two hours. By the time you're done, you know, you don't have enough time to do more testing if you need to. So this is not the entire final solution, but it gives you an idea. Again, you wanna take away the health and heartbeat and understand and truly feel how the data is reacting to everything that you're doing to it. Now, the stacking models, as always, they say a single model will never be, for the most case, a stacking approach. So we have code that's written in a pipeline. See this vertical piece here. Uh, what we used to do manually, you do not want to manually tweak literally parameters. So the number of combinations you're going to deal with in terms of especially the stacking ensemble and even the voting or you know, the deep learning model also, number of parameters and uh, you know, the limitless in almost in the combination that you can try. So there is a Bayesian optimizer tool out there. There's four ways of doing optimization. I'm not sure if you're aware of those four. It's the random search, grid search, Bayesian, and actually a, a, a gradient base. The gradient base is not quite there yet, but Bayesian optimizer, there's actually source code out there. I would encourage you, highly encourage you to actually take a look at this. It's very useful, the source code is available for you to use. Uh, so we use this to run all these models and be able to come up with a subset of uh, parameters that are optimized for the data set we're training against. So for the single model, these are, I'm not going to go through it in detail. We can talk about this maybe after the meeting. But we have tried all these models and see which ones stood out based on the optimal ones. What are the top ones we can choose to be able to use against our data set? And as these are being formed, all this information also feeding to the stacking side. The stacking, uh, the, the thing to remember about stacking is we can't just throw different models on it and keep on stacking. And the more we stack, the higher the score goes. It doesn't work that way. You got to be able to understand, again, what you, know, what you start with in terms of the stack. What models work the best with the data set that you have. That all comes from how you are literally testing your single models, understanding what they represent, and being able to stack against that. So what's interesting is we hit the limit, as Emma was saying earlier, we actually spent about a third of our time within two weeks doing the stacking model. We actually hit a maximum. No matter what we do on stacking, and everybody thinks, oh, XGBoost is the best. Every time you do XGBoost, you're going to win, win Kaggle competitions. In this specific scenario, not exactly the case. Um, so what we did was, uh, we had a parallel track going on in body classifiers. What's interesting is this actually boosted our score way past what the stacking model could do without XGBoost. Right, so you can see the, I mean, we still tried it with XGBoost just to see if it will work. It didn't work for the most part. We're hitting a limit. So I mean, there's something there about XGBoost that's causing a, a ceiling to be hit. When body classifiers came in, we hit, literally climbed the ranks quickly. And the combination, you can see what we used here. We actually ranked number two. The rest of the two-thirds of our time was trying to go from number two to number one. That was the most excruciating, painful process that we had to go through because we're fighting the point literally of about almost 10,000 of a point. That's how we're kind of climbing through. So ultimately, we were saying, you know, and, and at the same time, we're also doing the uh, Keras, uh, Diano, deep learning. We want to use that as a contingency to see if all, all else fails, can we use the deep learning model to climb the ranks? Again, all of these are happening in parallel. That's why you see all these arrows feeding across. Because number one, the secret of all of this is chunk your work out, do things in parallel, 
and be able to feed things that you optimally feel are being set into the, into the pipeline. And our code, the code that we wrote also reflects this process. It's very important you have a framework that literally drives this entire thing. You cannot hard code stuff when it actually runs sequentially. You're not going to be able to get past, especially in a corporate environment or startup, where you're asked to deliver at the end of the day on queue. Within three weeks, we want a prediction that you have, and we want it at the accuracy level of this and the precision level of this. This is the type of framework that you need to be established right off the bat and understand what this represents. So hopefully you can take this out to your, to your place of work and be able to take advantage of what this represents. Ultimately, it took the, uh, the voting and stacking model combined to be able to do this. Uh, if you're familiar with boosting, boosting tends, not all the time, but they tend to be a bit you know, better on the bias side, right, on the accuracy level. So the, the, the data that we had, somehow it's hitting a, a, a big uh, top, and we can't get past second to first place. So we thought there has to be something in there that would actually hopefully increase the precision side, right? So we were thinking, well, the precision or the variance piece, usually bagging works really well. So we tried some of the bagging methods. Didn't quite work. Um, there was one piece in the, if you're familiar with scikit-learn, there is a neural network classifier that we actually tried. And interestingly enough, when we ran that, we noticed that the, the accuracy level was not that high, but the precision was hitting it on the mark. This is, this, when that happened, that was the eureka moment that we acquired and say, wow, this is, the, this is maybe the light bulb that we need to be able to fire off this one. And we believe that that contributed to a lot of the generalization that's needed within that model to go from number two to number one. I think the lesson here is there is a process involved in how you combine models. There's no rule book for it. But I think it's very important that you get a truly good feel of how your data reacts and behaves. And you cannot go straight from trying to model something, go straight into a stack. Just because you know stack will always perform better than a single model, you got to start with the, with the basics. Try naive base, you know, a tried and true one. High performance, but it gives you a lot of clues on how data behaves. So that's a takeaway, and that's how we got to number one. And at the end of the day, Bayesian optimizers also, not a silver bullet. Don't think that you can just download the Bayesian optimizer, feed it all these hyperparameters, and be able to say, oh, we got all these magic numbers, and just plug it in. Number one, you got to understand what those parameters are doing. So you got to understand what each of those numbers that you're plugging in really imply to the model. Secondly, that last 5 to 10% after a Bayesian optimizer still requires the human in the loop involvement. That's what would set you apart from literally moving from the top five, top two, to literally a number one. And we're gonna we have tried this model in Higgs boson. It's the same exact process. We refine the process. We've always wanted to say, let's try this on another project to make sure that the process is repeatable, that it's reusable, and that it's independent sometimes from the people behind it, but it's the process that really drives it. And hopefully this is the one that we take away, that we learned a lot from. Still a lot to learn. We didn't do a lot much on deep learning. Uh, but we also learn about what it means to implement it. If you want to talk to us about our experiences of getting Keras Triano running on our you know, machine, what it took, the type of testing that we did, all of that, we can also talk about that. So just results and findings. Um, just quickly, the model seemed to perform well without the missing ballots included. Ultimately, with the missing ballots that we replaced with negative 999, that worked ultimately the best. We tried, of course, every which way but lose uh, in terms of mean, median, most frequent, uh, all of that. Uh, that negative 999 seems to have worked the best. Stacking and voting in combination tends to be at the better, best predictive power. Feature engineering would have wanted to do more of it, didn't help. In parallel, it was good insight to be able to say within the earlier stages of the process, it helped. But ultimately, I think the, the, the combination, the voting and stacking model actually took took precedence in terms of the performance increase. Uh, the incremental increase in the predictive accuracy, most calculus competitions, uh, if you go through that process, tends to be extremely uh, difficult as you climb the ranks. Tolerance is smaller. Uh, the type, you know, you don't want to be overfitting your data. So you don't want to be, obviously, you can't keep on uploading your data. That's not the way to do it. You got to really do extreme, uh, uh, you know, cross-validation. That is the key in the process. I didn't talk about that earlier, but cross-validation, it's one of the most important things that you need to do. You be able to provide, uh, compare your AUC for the true uh, the entire uh, data set against the cross-validated uh, test sets. 
that you want to compare those two numbers. And to, under, to understand if you're overfitting, underfitting, if both your numbers are low, that's totally underfitting. If you're kind of having your uh, cross-validation set going too high, that's, you know, that's not good either. Uh, lessons and insights. Hyperparameter uh, hyper tuning is time-consuming, period. It doesn't matter if you're using tools and whatnot. Uh, I wouldn't recommend, obviously, a grid search. A grid search, maybe, for some parameters is great, but in practical reasons, you really want to use Bayesian optimizer. And we're looking forward to the Gaussian-based one comes out. We want to be able to use that. But allocate some time for this. Uh, Hyperparameter uh, optimization does take a long while, so you've got to be selective how you're applying this when you're using it and be able to understand what those numbers that it spits out mean. Uh, Cross-validation, as I've already said, it's very critical for the entire process. Um, model gets to be tuned by a much more granular level as you climb the ranks. And agile process, the process is very important. Uh, the people, process, projects, and technology, all those four things, vertical, deeps, deep uh, curves, all work together seamlessly. So you got to have all those four down pat. Uh, any one of those that falls short will actually impact how you implement the machine learning projects within your company. Um, so as Bernard was saying earlier, we tried these learning models, um, didn't really work. Best ranking we got was 500 something. Um, it was really mediocre, especially considering there were only about 1,000 teams submitted. Um, we tried sequential um, neural network, which may be the reason why it didn't work really well. So we want to maybe try convolutional neural network and maybe a recurrent neural network. Um, also, feature engineering, everything we did seemed to work for uh, logistic regression and naive faith, so I suggest that we're on the right track, but not enough to uh, boost our score. And this is our number one track. So on that note, thank you very much for your attention. Question? Yes. I have a question about the agile process. So suppose uh, take two examples of I take one example, two step, the feature engineer and the statistical model. So when you're implementing the model, and uh, in the meantime you generate a new feature, do you implement that feature to the model immediately or, or do you wait the model until the model finish and uh, add the feature? That's a great question. Uh, it depends. Uh, depends on the cycle of, it depends in you know, if you're testing, like, sing, let's start with single model testing, right? Let's not even talk about ensembles. If you're testing a single model and you have maybe out of the four models you tested, you're on the third one at that point. And the, you know, the, the, mis, the imputed numbers start to come in or the featured engineer set starts to come in. By the time you hit the third model, you already have a baseline of how the other two models perform. So now you can start feeding in like, oh, you know, all these three models that I trained against was the entire data set. Now let me try a, a re-engineered set and see how that goes. Now you, you can compare and contrast. But if you're still doing model one, that doesn't work. yeah, it doesn't work. I mean, you, you could probably do both and say, let me do the full data set and let me do the engineered set. You can do that as a baseline. But I would usually suggest by the time, hopefully when the imputations comes through and the actual engineered sets start to come through, you're hopefully, single model testing is so fast. I mean, you're talking about sub-second testing in a naive base and do enough iterations of it and different combinations of hyperparameters, or parameters in this case, to know how the data behaves. By the time you hit the third model, maybe a, a, an easy decision tree, let's not even talk about the boosted one, right? Uh, I think you should be able to get a sense of, uh, you know, it kind of had some consistency in certain places. Maybe the tree base works better versus the, the bagging, maybe, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, we have only a few features, right? Yes. Ten. Yes. Mm -hmm. And those were given, or did you choose them maybe out of the 200 the, the, Those were given. So we were only given 10 features. Okay, so you didn't need to do feature selection. Right, well, we um, tried to do it with the PCA. Um, that was our effort in selecting features. And then we found that um, most of the features had some contribution to the overall variance. So we decided to keep all of them. Right, there was only 10. It's actually pretty small. Yeah, the way we approached that quickly was to literally, uh, you saw the feature engineer said, we actually combined some of it. We tried two ways every time we do that. We literally drop the source. If we take three to feed one, we drop the three, feed, use the other one, or we actually kept everything. Tried both ways, 
You know, some helped, some didn't, but it didn't surpass the technical approach and everything. I'm asking this because for such problems, usually there are hundreds of features. That's right. That's why I said it's, so, it, you perfectly hit it on the head because, uh, some, you know, sometimes thousands, right? And that's an extreme, but you're looking at the so few, I mean, the data observations are so few and the features are also so few. That's also another extreme problem that we're going to do. So it's really up to your creativity. You know, today say it's not enough data and observation, create your own, right? And that is like, you know, your imagination is the only limit on that one.